speaking about uh, prime walks to infinity in Z adjoined root. Two. And also Daniel Cernacki. Sorry. Uh, so you're both you're both talking. Okay, great. So thank you for uh, for agreeing to speak. So shall we start right now? <laughs> Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk about uh, prime walk to infinity in, in zero two. And uh, uh, this is our joint walk in polymaths, are you? We are both undergraduates and I'm an undergraduate in uh, Michigan, uh, University of Michigan. It, and Daniel is uh, a rising junior in Cornell. And this project is, is advised by uh, Professor Stephen J. Miller and our uh, TA's tutor and uh, Nawa Pan. So yeah, uh, let's begin our introduction. So uh, we start with a simple question uh, in this project. Can, can one walk to infinity, infinity with bounded steps on real line just using primes? Uh, well, this, this, this question is pretty simple and the answer is no. Because we can pick a prime p, like any p such that p is greater than n, uh, and with that um, a p mod, uh, primario uh, here, and we can construct a cons consecutive composite numbers uh, such that uh, the product of all these primes is, uh, is less than or equal to that p. Then, so here we 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 have uh, have an example, common example of that question. Then, well, what if we consider Gaussian primes or primes in z i instead of z? Well, the figure here below shows all the Gaussian primes of form less than one thousand here. Um, what would the question? What would the answer be if we change the z to z i? Um, can what, can we walk in theory with bounded steps on on z i? Just using the prime uh, prime elements in that ring. Well, the answer is no, but I will tell you why exactly you know, later. The the because then at, we we see that the number of Gaussian primes in disk of, disk of radius n is just about uh, have the order n square over log n, and and, and there's a a, a quite famous theorem telling that uh, there exists a moat or we can see a gaps between primes such that it has width six in ZI. So that means we cannot walk uh, to infinity within distance six in ZI. Um, so, and it's also widely believed that we cannot walk to infinity with any bounded step size. Uh, there's a there's a message in the chat. Sorry, oh, I oh, just the missed the definition, and I feel I'm going to be lost. Can you just say again, like? Um, what 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 is prime walk? Okay, uh, so so prime walk is just like um, so. Let's say that a uh, prime walk with within distance two in real line would be like uh, consecutive primes uh, within distance two. So uh, let's say two, three, five, seven, and so on. And things like uh, eight and nine are not primes, so there isn't a prime walk within uh, of distance two in unreal line. Does that make sense? Or? And uh, yeah, we'll continue the talk. And what if we consider um, what if we consider the the integer ring for that in, uh, integer ring z root n for any integer m instead of just the i? So here m can be any integer. Uh, so in this talk, we choose m to be uh, two. So we consider the ring zero two. Well, the simple observation was that if uh, m is less than zero, then the ring has only finitely many units. But if m is greater than zero, the ring would have infinitely many units. So the number of uh, prime elements will differ a lot because if we have a lot of units, then we must have a lot of prime 
uh, elements in that ring. So that will make making a, a, a prime walk more easier to happen. So we think that may, uh, in ring zero two, there must be more uh, pot, there must be more chances or opportunities to have a prime walk than uh, ZI. Um, well, since the number of primes is much less, so much larger, we uh, guess or conjecture that it's more possible to have a prime walk in these rings. Uh, so, and we start with the easiest one, zero, two now. So here is a, a bunch of definitions uh, for a project. So the norm of an element a plus root to b is uh, just a squared minus two b squared. And uh, we've got two elements associated so if they have the same norm. We define the standard prime in zero, two as the following forms. Uh, with minimal Euclidean norm. So the first kind is root two, or uh, it's of the form a plus root two b such that a, uh, its norm is a real prime modulo one or seven uh, modulo, p, modulo eight is equal to one or seven modulo eight, or it's uh, a plus root two b such that b is zero. So it's just a real prime equals three or five modulo eight. So, uh, and, and we'll notice that any uh, primes or regular primes or prime elements uh, of zero two is just uh, standard primes with associates. So for example, root two is a prime element in zero two. And for example, um, one plus root two b is a unit and it's also a prime element. Yeah, and also we notice that by this definition, the, the primes in zero two has a fourfold symmetry. So that means uh, for any a plus root to b, be a prime minus a plus root to b, or a minus root to b, or minus a minus root to b, it's also, it's also prime. So uh, that, that means uh, we only need to focus on the first quadrant right now. And, and the figure below uh, shows uh, how the number of primes in this radius n in z i and uh, z and zero two compares with each other. So the blue points are the, are, are the number of prime elements in zero two, and the red points are the number of prime elements in z i. So we can see that uh, we can see that actually the the, the prime elements are, more, are, are are like there are more primes in zero two than z d i. So which uh, agrees with our conjecture. Uh, now we try to visualize these uh, standard primes in zero two. So uh, here we represent each uh, prime uh, a plus root to b as a dot in R two, and uh, like a and a, at a b. And the figure below shows all the standard primes for x y uh, less than uh, eight hundred. Uh, most primes, uh, we can, it's clear to see that most primes tend to cluster around the asymptote. Like there's a clearly a, a line up, up there, and it's the line is uh, x minus square root of y equals zero, and this is actually just the formula for the norm function x square minus two y square, the asymptote of that norm function. So um, yeah, so yeah, then you will take it. Next. Yeah, so. We uh, conjecture that there exists some finite step size k such that there exists an unbounded walk along the primes of z square root 2, where we have the restriction that for all n, we, um, our next prime in the walk is further from the origin than the previous one, where we use the Euclidean distance to uh, mean further from the origin. And we have two different approaches. One is to form a random model of the primes in z square root two. So we can make some probabilistic statements. And the other approach was to perform some moat calculations, which is basically where you generate all, all possible walks. And then you see if there is, uh, if you can find some moat where the, the gaps between primes are just too big to cross. So the idea with the random model is we compute an estimate for the probability a given point is prime based only on its norm. Then we use this estimate to build a greedy model that approximates an average walk. The reason for doing this is uh, it allows us to look at the long-term behavior of walks when it becomes too computationally expensive to generate all walks. Ideally, we could just uh, perform moat calculations, but um, this does get very computationally expensive. So 
Uh, we think that um, if we could form some sort of a model, then this would allow us to uh, look at the behavior of the walks, which we'll talk about why it's important to look at this later. So first we want to estimate the number of primes. And uh, so we consider primes in the region absolute value of a squared minus 2b squared is less than or equal to r, which straddles the asymptotes. Um, the reason why we chose this region is because it's a generalization of the disk region for Gaussian primes. And now we're using the norm of z square root 2. For Gaussian primes, we're looking in the region a squared plus b squared is less than or equal to r squared. But now we just replace a squared plus b squared with the norm of z squared root 2. And this region is unbounded as it approaches the asymptotes. And in fact, there are definitely many lattice points in this region also. So we look at the prime number theorem to uh, determine the number of primes. So the prime number theorem says that if we consider an interval one to n, we have about n divided by log n primes. But using the connection between ordinary primes and primes in z squared two that Ben mentioned earlier, we are able to generalize the prime number theorem to the ring z squared root two. So this says that the number of primes in z squared root two within the region that we mentioned before is about this number here on the order of r squared divided by log r. Similarly, the prime number theorem in Gaussian integers says that the number of Gaussian primes in the disk of radius r about the origin is this estimate you see here, which has the same order of magnitude as um, the prime number theorem for z square root two. What's interesting about this though is that there are infinitely many lattice points in, in the region for, um, for z square root two, but the regions are bounded for Gaussian integers. So this is pretty interesting. Um, as an aside, we also calculated the number of primes in a circle of radius r in the first quadrant for Gaussian integer, for Gaussian integers. So uh, quickly, we um, looked at the Gauss circle problem, which um, says that there are about pi r squared total lattice points inside a circle of radius r. Uh, the Gauss circle problem talks more about the, the error on this, but this estimate's good enough for us. And we estimated the expected value by assuming each point in annulus between circles of radius d plus r and d minus r. That's about the same probability of being prime. So we got the actual circle we were looking at and then fit it in between um, two different two concentric circles and uh, an estimate on it being prime. So it's this estimate right here that you see. So back to z square root two. Now that we estimated the number of primes in uh, a norm region, z square root two, now we wanna look at the total number of lattice points or integers in that region. So we would like to count families of infinite solutions that have the same magnitude as those that we previously counted. So this means that we want to have some way, we know that it's going to be infinitely many lattice points, but we want to count it in such a way that we can actually divide by our previous estimate and get a finite number. So as before, any solution z belongs to a family of solutions z times one plus square root two to two n, which maintains a norm. Uh, this is just because if you multiply any, any uh, any solution by one plus the square root of two and then take the norm, the norm is just going to remain the same. So we find these families of solutions by considering the equation a squared minus two b squared equals c for a given or fixed integer c that has absolute value less than or equal to r squared. And this theorem by Bernays uh, basically tells us uh, how to do this. So for any quadratic form defined on the integers with integer coefficients, such that a squared minus RT is not square, the number of positive integers less than N that can be expressed as a function of F is on the order of N divided by the square root of log N. Uh, so that gives the estimate right there. But this theorem that we developed right here uh, tells us that if we can do this for a positive integer C, then we can also uh, have a solution for a negative integer C just because the uh, the norm only changes by a factor of negative one. So combining our two main estimates, we obtain the following summary. The probability that an integer in z squared two with norm n is prime is about on the order of one divided by log n. 
one divided by the square root of log n. But by comparison, in the integers and in the Gaussian integers, um, the number of uh, integers is on the order of one divided by log n. So as Ben showed earlier with that graph, there are more, the, the, the primes in uh, z square root two are actually more dense than in the Gaussian integers and in the normal integers. So this gives more evidence that a walk might be possible. Um, yeah, I'll later, uh, yeah, I'll talk about the, how we use to visualize actually these um, prime walks in zero two now. And the algorithm we use is by Stan Wagon. It, 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 its idea is by Stan Wagon and, and, and there are a uh, total four steps in this algorithm. So the first step is to identify all the primes in the disk of uh, in zero two. And then we, for each prime, we find its D neighbors. Uh, D is the, it's the step size we want. Um, and for, then we form the road network connecting all the primes and their D neighbors. And finally, we find the connected component of square two, which is our, the start or the origin of our prime walk that we want to be. So this, the first image here uh, is the prime walk in zero two with uh, distance two. So that means, so that's the, like the longest prime walk we can get. So we can see the, the far, farthest point we achieve is about uh, 30, 30. So, and the, the second image here shows the prime walk uh, with distance square root eight. So here, actually this walk doesn't stop at, even at the very boundary of the picture. So we can see that the big difference between these. So even we change the, the distance, the, the size, the step size for a very little bit from uh, two to square root eight. And so, um, Next, I'll introduce something about Pell's equation. And Pell's equation is, by definition, is uh, x squared minus 2y squared equals 1. And we can see that like, this expression for Pell's equation actually is just the, uh, it's just the, norm curve, the norm function when it's equal to 1. And a generalized Pell's equation is when it's equal c for some constant c. To, so to solving the integer solutions to, uh, to generalize Pell's equation is actually just finding all primes of norm C. Um, and we have a lemma that says there is only one non-trivial solution up to associate any generalized Pell's equation with constant C uh, equals one or seven modulo eight. So uh, remember that if, a Pell's, if, if our function has a norm one or seven modulo eight, then it's the, the standard prime or the prime elements that we want. Um, then using this lemma, we're able to prove the next theorem, which says it's, impo it's impossible to walk to infinity using primes of only finitely many norms or integer solutions to only finitely many generalized Pell's equations. Um, so, so we first... So uh, quick warning, uh, you need to finish in about the next minute. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we could... Uh, just get this proof and then I could just quickly do the next yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, we, we go so over- Here is just a proof sketch of the, the theorem I talked about. Yeah, the, the last theorem we had here was that it's actually impossible to perform a walk of bounded step size from infinity and z square root two if we remain within some bounded distance of the asymptote y equals one over the square root times x. Um, th there's a proof sketch here. Basically, we um, compared the growth of the number of uh, possible primes that we could walk on versus the number of steps that we take. And we find that the growth is, uh, the growth of the number of solutions is, is uh, faster than the number of uh, steps that we take. So here's a picture where the, the curves that the primes could possibly lie on um, enter this bounded region here. And uh, that's it. So we'd like to thank Professor Stephen Miller and the two TAs for helping us in this RU. All right, let's thank our speakers. That was a very nice talk. Any questions? So, so I have one. Uh, what was special about two adjoined root two, or z adjoined root two? Uh, does this work for other 
quadratic rings. Oh, so for, for zero two, we noticed that, like you see that there's a poly uh, or a hyperbola pattern that the primes uh, like uh, has. So we guess maybe uh, it's more possible to have a prime walk along that asymptote. And it turns out uh, the primes cluster along that asymptote. But even with that property, we cannot guarantee there is a prime walk. So for any other rings, that haven't like doesn't have this property, we would think like maybe it's uh, like nearly even more impossible to, to have that prime walk. So that's kind of true. Yeah. So we think that that the existence of that asymptote that the primes cluster along is is a big factor in determining. Well, it's a big factor in in making it easy to compute whether it's possible yeah. or not possible. Got it. Great. Thank you. All right, well, let's thank our speakers again. And then uh, we have the coffee break coming up next, uh, the make your own coffee break.